Iwo Jima, a barren volcanic island, lies midway between the Marianas and the Japanese homeland. Our heavy bombers, attacking the Empire, pass the island. The airfields at Iwo could base fighter escort for them. But the island already had strong defenses, and the Japanese were multiplying their strength. For several months, Iwo had been subjected to increasingly heavy high-altitude bombing attacks and long-range ship bombardments. By the 1st of January, there were 456 enemy installations on Iwo. Aerial reconnaissance indicated that most of these defenses were permanent, heavily protected by reinforced concrete and carefully camouflaged. For another month, we bombed the island every day, and while we bombed, the enemy built. Undismayed by another six weeks of incessant bombing, the enemy continued to build until there were 750 defensive positions on Iwo just three days before we were scheduled to invade. On the morning of February 16th, a fire support force of six old battleships and five cruisers enclosed the island. A patrol of destroyers and APDs screened this operation, while each ship fired into its designated area at known targets. As a further protection against submarines, carrier aircraft patrolled from dawn to dark. This double screen permitted the fire support ship to operate throughout the day unmolested. The island's 750 defensive positions had been assigned serial numbers and priorities, and each ship attempted to destroy as many specific targets in its assigned area as possible. But the enemy held his fire, and there was no visible evidence of the 20,000 troops, the hundreds of mutually supporting blockhouses, pillboxes, and caves. Furthermore, to conserve limited ammunition, the fire support ships were ordered not to waste a shot by firing without effective observation. But efficient air spotting was greatly curtailed by bad weather. As a result of these unfavorable conditions, only about half of the scheduled firing was completed, and little damage was inflicted on the major defenses. On the morning of February 17th, minesweepers moved across the eastern beaches where our landings were to be made. Proceeding along the front of the beaches, within 300 yards of the shore, they passed right under the nose of the Japanese defenders, drawing only light and intermittent fire. Even from this close range, there was little to indicate the enemy's defensive strength. As the last of the minesweepers were passing Surabachi, the gunboats supporting the underwater reconnaissance moved in toward the beach. To the enemy, waiting in concealment, it must have appeared that we intended to land as the gunboats moved in, the Jap revealed for the first time the great strength of his beach defenses. Heavy fire from the right flank indicated concealed guns not shown on any map. As this intense aimed fire was pouring onto the gunboats, it became clear that the landing beaches were most formidably defended. One after another, the gunboats were hit and set on fire. Some that had been ordered to withdraw to put out fires and repair damage sent this dispatch back to the force commander. Request permission to return to the line. They returned in a hail of fire and again were severely hit. In the face of this heavy fire, the personnel boats dropped their swimmers. support ships continued to pound the beaches, laying down phosphorus when it became apparent that aircraft could not provide the scheduled smoke screen. Again and again, the crippled gunboats sent back the message, request permission to return to the line. The terrific punishment they received in fighting it out at point-blank range with long odds in favor of the defenders demonstrated a courage as magnificent as any displayed in a naval engagement since the days of John Paul Jones. Relief gunboats replaced those that were out of operation. Inside 45 minutes, 12 gunboats had been hit. 40 men had been killed and another 140 had been wounded.
The swimmers completed their reconnaissance of the beach, and shortly after noon, all but one had been recovered. They found no underwater or beach obstructions. The reconnaissance, however, dispelled any notion that the island was not heavily defended. The greater part of the installations remained undamaged. The strength and effectiveness of the enemy fire had demonstrated that Iwo Jima was the most heavily fortified position ever assaulted by the Marine Corps. Effective enfilading fire from the medium caliber batteries at the base of Suribachi and from the battery somewhere on the right flank was capable of inflicting very heavy damage. These batteries, along with the blockhouses and pillboxes on the landing beaches, would seriously jeopardize the success of the landing itself unless they were knocked out. Only one more day was left to destroy them. Accordingly, fire schedules were altered for the final day. The targets were 16 blockhouses, 56 pillboxes, the casemated guns at the base of Suribachi, and on the right flank, the newly revealed battery. Against these, a concentration of destructive fire at short range was ordered. The Idaho took the casemates on the right flank. The Tennessee took the batteries at the base of Suribachi. Through this crossfire, the New York and Nevada worked on targets in the beach area. The ships were directed to make every effort to obtain the greatest possible effect from each remaining round of ammunition, each minute of time. Veteran battleships of the type sunk at Pearl Harbor came back swinging powerful destructive blows. Old ships, obsolete equipment, and half-forgotten principles now showed their strength. This was elementary gunnery, the crosswire on the point of aim. The ships and spotting planes had become familiar with the location and appearance of the targets. It was known that accessible installations in other parts of the island were sure to give trouble after the landing of the early assault waves. It was known that more installations could be found and destroyed with an additional day of bombardment. But at the end of 12 hours of continuous, deliberate short-range shooting, the casemates had been destroyed. 15 blockhouses and 19 pillboxes had been damaged or destroyed. Thanks to the naval gun, a landing could be made if necessary. At daybreak on February 19th, the gunfire support element commenced their scheduled firing. The time for preliminary destruction had passed. Everything must be concentrated on close support of the landing. The gunfire was lifted briefly to permit heavy airstrikes. Assault waves were preceded by gunboats, drenching the beach with water. As the leading wave passed the line of fire support ships, the overhead barrage began. This called for split-second timing and perfect control. At 15 minutes before H hour, the fire was concentrated on the first few yards of beach. wave approached the beach. The rolling overhead barrage preceded them by 400 yards, moving up as they advanced.
only sporadic gunfire met the approaching wave, and the touchdown of the leading wave was made with comparatively light losses. The worst was yet to come. After we had secured the island, we took these pictures of the defenses that the naval gun had destroyed before the landing was made. These were some of the pillboxes, the blockhouses, the casemates, the artillery emplacements, the anti-aircraft guns we had been shooting at. Iwo Jima was captured only after many days of coordinated assault by infantry, artillery, air, and naval gunfire. Iwo Jima was captured only at great cost. Iwo Jima proved that against numerous small, strongly protected defenses, high altitude bombing and long range bombardment directed into target areas achieves negligible damage. The bulk of the destruction of individual defenses was accomplished by the naval gun. Employing deliberate fire from close ranges, the large naval gun proved to be the only weapon of sufficient penetrating power and accuracy to ensure the destruction of heavily protected specific defenses. 